Welcome. We're glad you found this recorded presentation by the Knox County Master Gardeners. We are a volunteer community service group affiliated with the University of Tennessee, as well as Tennessee State University and their cooperative extension programs. The mission of the Knox County Master Gardener program is to educate and serve the community using research-based information on best practices in horticulture, environmental stewardship, and integrated pest management. One of the ways we educate is through our Speakers Bureau. We normally present to live audiences four times a month, with two topics being presented twice, once on a Saturday at a county branch library and a repeat on a weekday at a county senior center. But with COVID-19, these are not normal times. During May, all four of our regular county venues were closed. The duration of those closures is expected to be eight weeks. And because of our affiliation with the University of Tennessee, we are banned from any public gathering of any size until August 1. So after sitting on the sidelines during April and May, we have found an alternate way to present the talks that we had on the schedule for June and July. It is likely that we will continue this alternate delivery method in August. We hope to be back in front of live audiences for September and October, and if we are, we plan to record those sessions. If group gatherings of up to 50 people are still prohibited, we will complete our planned schedule using this new format. On the slide, you see our web website address and a portion of our website homepage. The website provides information on Knox County Master Gardener projects and activities, and includes a calendar of events. All of our Speakers Bureau talks are on this calendar and include the name of the presenter, the topic, and a brief description. For the talks given in this alternative method, you will also find the link to where the recorded presentation can be found. Thanks again for finding this particular recording. And now, let's get started with the actual presentation. All right, well, thank you for joining me, Vanessa, for today's um, Master Gardener Speakers Bureau talk focused on summer pruning. Let's go ahead and just dive right in. Our next slide is gonna go ahead and keep, uh, let us see what our objectives are. Um, we're gonna start today and kind of review the following items. We're gonna start with why we prune our plants. Then we'll move into talking about a record of pruning in your landscape and why we recommend keeping that type of record. We're going to go into how to pick that proper pruning tool for the job and then some basic pruning techniques to keep in mind. Then we'll move into looking into which plants to prune based on the summer month that we're going to be in. And then we'll go ahead and pull out some specific plants that we know are common to East Tennessee and discuss how to best prune them. Let's go ahead and start with our very first objective, which is to understand why we prune. Now here you'll see on your slide, we've got the three Ds. That is one of the main reasons to prune any plant is to manage the three Ds. Those would be dead plant material, diseased plant material, and damaged. You should be pruning any and all of these three Ds at any time of the year. So whenever you notice them on your plant, go ahead and prune them off. Now the next reason we have is size control. That is just keeping it the shape you need or basically with the size, you know, how tall, how big, or how small you prefer it to be. You'll also see here we've called out stay ahead of KUB. We know that's the Knoxville utility. They will come through and prune for you, but Sometimes it's not the way you would prune that plant, so it's not that beneficial to it. So if you take on your pruning, you can hopefully stay ahead of them and prune in a way that really helps that plant in your lands landscape. And of course, anytime you're pruning for size control, you're really still pruning to control that it's overall shape and the direction of its growth. So those three kind of work hand in hand. Pruning is also useful to use for improving the flowering or the fruiting and foliage density. 
Finally, we use pruning to make sure the area around that plant or tree is more convenient or safe. So think about any times you want to walk under the tree or you need to mow under the tree, if the tree's near your driveway, that kind of a thing. So we use it for those convenience and safety type features also. Now that we've established the reasons that we prune, let's talk about keeping a record of pruning. Super important here. Maybe you're thinking, hey, my yard is really not that big. I don't have that many plants to worry about to keep an actual pruning record. But maybe a few years down the road, you do have a lot more plants that need pruning. Or maybe when you're sitting there thinking about, I'm going to tackle this pruning job, you realize just how many plants you do have to keep track of. Either way, it's really great to start and then maintain a simple record of which plants you have in your yard the recommended time to prune them, and how to best prune that plant. So to start with, if you're not sure of all the plants in your landscape, maybe you can identify some, but not all of them. You can, of course, go to Google, type in a description of that plant, look at the images, see if that helps you narrow it down. There are also many phone apps available. Some are free. Some charge a small annual fee. Um, they really help you take a picture of that plant and again, narrow it down on those images. I'm a fan of the app called Picture This. It is, I think, a $10 fee per year. So it may or may not be an investment you want to make. But to me, it's been one of the most accurate. And, uh, and it actually, it works great on trees uh, when I'm on my hikes and just, you know, see some plants where I'm like, I don't even know if I've seen this before or not. It, it has been super great. So whatever you use, your first goal is to identify your plants. And of course, you can always get the help of your extension agent folks too. I don't want to leave them out. So after you use whatever tools you need to to identify that plant, you can take another trip back to Google and always start with a good Google search on recommendations for pruning that plant. Now, we do recommend that you use trusted resources, so ones from the extension services. And you can even Google here, step two on our second bullet, shows you that you can Google, you know, how to prune and then put the name of your plant in there and then include the word extension. That way, those extension results will show at the top of the list, make it a lot easier for you. After you've ID'd all your plants, now it's time to make a plan. So you can just use a calendar on your phone, maybe you've got a printout calendar, or even just, you know, a notebook to have like a journal type entry. Really whatever makes sense to you that you know um, you like to keep records in and is something you can utilize. Important things here to note when you're making that record and using it throughout the season. Of course, you want to start with making a list of all your landscape plants. Uh, we even have some people actually draw a very simple map of their yard, of their landscape, and they'll draw and list the name of each plant there, or, you know, the major groupings, that kind of a thing. That way, they have no question on, I'm at this point in my yard, I know what plants I'm looking at. So again, it is really whatever works for you. Now, as you list out your plants, you also want to note how often they should be pruned. So annually, biannual. You can also list the pruning practice, which tells you, you know, this plant needs to be pruned lightly, not a heavy hand, or this plant can handle a heavy um, pruning. Also, want to go ahead and write down the reason you're pruning. Maybe you're thinning that plant for improved airflow or sun exposure, or maybe more for shaping or to improve the vigor. Writing down the reason that you're pruning is going to be great next year when you look back on it and you're ready to tackle it again because then all that research you did to make sure you're pruning it correctly and going about it the right way, it'll just help jog your memory like, oh yeah, I'm trying to make my rhododendron, you know, bushier and have more bloom. So that's why I'm pruning it this way. Also, regarding that recommended season for pruning, when you make a note of that, you know, you may just be writing down early summer or fall. And also write down if it's best, if it's recommended to be done after or before the plant blooms. Now at the very bottom of this slide right now, you'll see a green sentence coming across your screen and it tells us to document, <clears throat> excuse me, when your flowering shrub blooms. That way you're going to know if it's blooming on old wood versus new wood. Let's go ahead and take a closer look into why this is very, very useful information to have and to make a record of. So here we've got blooming times, and we've got in the bottom right that's very specific July 1st date. 
That's what we call our decision date in East Tennessee. It is very specific to East Tennessee, this July 1st date. And here's what you need to know. Your plant that blooms before July 1st, it is actually blooming on the previous year's wood. So that's old wood. We have azaleas, flowering dogwood, rhododendron, and forsythia listed here as great examples of that. Here, in this case, you wanna make sure you prune after they bloom. If you prune before, <clears throat> excuse me, then you're actually pruning off this year's blooms and you're doing more harm to that plant than just a simple, I'm gonna prune you to make you better. Now the opposite's true for those blooming shrubs that bloom after July 1st. We've got our examples here of the butterfly bush, crepe myrtle, hollies, hibiscus. Um, those are actually blooming on the current year's growth, so that's that new wood. You're going to want to prune these in late winter or early spring. That's going to be just before their new leaves appear. We'll talk more about that butterfly bush and crepe myrtle in a little bit, but the key is they're blooming after July 1st, so you're going to prune them later in the winter or early spring. Moving on still with that record keeping, just a few more things to note. After you record if the blooms occur on that old or new wood, here's a few things you wanna jot down after you go about pruning your plant. So soon after you prune, you wanna make a note of what you pruned and when, you know, just a simple, you know, it was mid-May, you might wanna write down, you know, May 15th, however. It's also a good time to go ahead and mark next year's calendar. If you use those phone reminders, however you want to do it, so you can stay ahead of it next year. Also, that third bullet there on the left that says how the plant responded. So you may be making this note in your journal a few days later, even a few weeks later, after you notice how that plant responded to pruning. <clears throat> and the reason we recommend that is because if you're new to pruning or not, maybe you went out there and you thought, okay, this, I know this plant, it doesn't really take a heavy pruning, so I'm going to go about it easy. And then all of a sudden, three days later, you're like, I think I may have killed my plant. You might want to make a note that, hey, it took a while for it to bounce back, but it did. Or I did not prune a lot, but I think it still was too much. So however you want to kind of record how that plant responded could prove useful. Now, and maybe it's one of those where you only write down how the plant responded if it goes wrong. If it goes well, you don't need a note. You'll just know next year, hey, it must have went fine. I said write a note. But just some things, you know, to keep in mind. The goal here is to really set up your record keeping system the way it works for you to help save you time next year and to keep those plants thriving. Next up, we are up to pruning tools. Well, let's go ahead and talk about some of those common tools that'll help you get the job done. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, in this picture, you're going to see some basic manual equipment all the way up to that chainsaw. And we know a simple trip to the garden store or that big box store, and you're going to find any pruning tool you like. Here's the key to picking the right tool. It should match the size of the cut you're making. So think about those shears. Those are for smaller cuts, small shrubs and hedges. You've got the electric and the manual both that you can use as shears. <clears throat> Hand pruners are the next step up usually. They're great for those wood cuts up to three-fourths an inch. Loppers are next. They go up to cuts up to one inch. Then your saws can start coming in. And that's not necessarily a chainsaw, but we do have a pole saw here. But when your diameter is bigger than an inch, you may need that pole saw, especially if you're cutting overhead. And then we do have the three cut method here. We recommend this anytime you're cutting away wood that's greater than two inches in diameter. Now we've got a great picture of this three cut method. Here you can see um, where the cuts should be made. They're labeled first cut, second cut, third cut. Cutting it this way really allows you to control when and where that branch is gonna fall. So it keeps you safe. And it also best protects the tree. You know, if we were just to do all of that cut just at the first cut, so we just try to cut through that branch from the bottom up, you know, we're gonna leave a lot of that limb still stuck to the trunk of the tree. That's a big exposure to bacteria and fungus. So this third cut method is super, super um, helpful. You're gonna see this image a little bit later in our slideshow too. We will reference back to it there. So you pick the tool, 
that you got to use for the job. Burp next up, you want to make sure you sanitize it before you use it. Maybe you did a great job of cleaning that tool last season before you put it in the shed. Um, maybe you didn't. Either way, it doesn't hurt to give it a quick wipe down with, you know, a Lysol wipe or a spray with disinfectant. Rubbing alcohol is fine too. Just make sure you start out with a good clean tool. That way, if there's any kind of plant disease on it from last year that survived, you're not just infecting the healthy plants in your landscape. As you are pruning, if you know you are pruning some diseased plant material, even if you're not sure what disease you're working with, it never hurts to sanitize as you go. And that is as simple as using those hand pruners, making that cut, spraying them down real quick with a disinfectant, giving it a few seconds to air dry, making the next cut, spraying it again. Simple as that, not trying to make it hard, but that way you're not infecting that healthy plant tissue as you go. Secondly, you do want to make sure your tools are sharp. Um, you know, when you're pruning, it is considered a wound to the plant. So you want to minimize that wound as much as possible. Tools that aren't that sharp end up kind of crushing that stem or that branch while it's trying to cut. So it causes a bigger wound. So sharper tools, the better. All right, can't forget about our own safety and comfort while we're out there working hard in our landscape. So any personal protective equipment you need, please make sure you take time to go ahead and get it. Of course, if it's a sunny day, like we're getting here recently, <clears throat> we wanna use that sunscreen, um, safety goggles or glasses. So doesn't matter if it's hot or cold out there, we wanna make sure we protect those eyes. We've probably all been there where we went to do some pruning and you go to snap a little stem away and all of a sudden something comes flying at your face that you didn't know was on that branch or near it. So protect those eyes. We've also got your gloves, your hats, your knee pads, and your insect repellent listed here. But make sure you're safe when you go out there to prune. Okay, so we've got the plants in our landscape identified. We've got a good record keeping calendar going. We've picked our proper tool. We've looked at that protective equipment. And now we're ready to actually get into some basic pruning techniques. Here's the first rule of thumb you want to keep in mind, no matter what plant you're pruning. Take a look at it. Step back, look at it in your landscape, and kind of look at how that plant naturally grows. That's going to help you kind of determine what needs to be done when you're pruning. That second bullet, we can't stress it enough. Do not ask that plant to be something it's not by the way you prune. Think of your forsythia. It likes to grow in like a big, light, you know, loose kind of spray plant, all like free love <laughs> type of plant. You don't want to prune that plant in a way that you're saying, I'm going to expect you to be a, an upright, rigid plant. You don't want to do that. So work with that plant's natural structure. Third, start at the bottom. This is the best way to gauge how much you're pruning off that plant and to see that shape develop with each cut. If you start at the top or the outsides before you know it, you may have a lopsided hedge or this plant where you're like, well, I didn't think that was gonna be taken off that much. So start at the bottom. Once you kind of got that good and shaped up, thin out anything in the middle if you need to, and then give a little haircut to any extra on the top that you need to remove. We do have here at that last bullet, do not make the mistake of starting at the top. So the bottom is where you wanna start. All right, we've got three good examples of kind of foundational pruning things um, to look at a little bit closer to keep in mind. So the first one is thinning. If you are looking at your bush or your shrub and your, your bigger plant and your goal is to thin it to improve airflow or sunlight exposure, this is the visual you wanna focus in on. So the plant on the left has those red marks. Those red marks represent where you're gonna be making your pruning cuts. You make those cuts in those locations and then you see the plant on the right is what's supposed to be left over from our pruning. So you can see how we have removed that material to really open up that plant. So that, that kind of helps you know what your goal is when you're going to thinning, when you're looking at pruning. Next up is heading. So this is the visual for you if you're wanting to head out those flowers. Again, the red marks on the uh, bush here to the left are your pruning cut locations. In this case, you're trimming back those major nodes in order to reshape that plant, decrease that plant height. 
Now here, it's really important to remember the one third rule. We bring it up here, but it's true of pretty much any plant, tree, shrub, whatever you're gonna go prune. And that one third rule is simply to not prune away more than one third of that total plant material in one pruning season. If you prune away more than one third of that plant, you're actually leaving your plant with so many wounds to recover from that it's gonna struggle. It's gonna have a harder time to recovering and actually trying to thrive after that. Now it could bounce back. It's just most likely going to take more time to bounce back. So if you're sitting there thinking, look, I just bought this property. I don't know when it's been pruned last, but it looks like never. Or, hey, I've been trying to keep up with my pruning, but last year was a hard year. I couldn't get out and do it. I really need to take off more than one third of that plant. Please, 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 if you can, just know that with those plants, you're going to need to spread out your pruning over the next few seasons. So prune away one third of it this year. Next pruning season, tackle the next one third. That way you're really giving that plant the best chance to be pruned in a healthy way so it continues to thrive in that landscape for you. The third final example of just basic pruning techniques would be shearing. And of course that's used to shape your shrubs and your hedges. So in this case, you wanna taper them. So you want that base wider than the top. That's another great reason to start pruning at the bottom. So you can set that overall width of the bottom and then start to taper those cuts up. Now we do want to call out our evergreens. They are a special case and that's because they can actually be pruned twice a year. So when that new growth is young and green, we're thinking spring and we're thinking midsummer. You do not want to prune them in late summer or early fall because pruning actually triggers new growth. And that new growth, if you prune it late summer, or early fall, it's going to still be too new and too young to actually handle the exposure to our winter cold. Also with those flowering shrubs, just wanted to give you a good visual here on where do I make that cut? How should it be? So the picture on the left is just our plant there. We point out the lateral bud and the terminal. You wanna prune it back to that lateral bud or a large branch. Now we've got a growing direction there in the middle with that blue arrow. So we're growing straight up here. But the one on the right shows you that red hash mark again. So this is again where you wanna make that cut. And you wanna make it perpendicular, in this case, to that lateral bud. That's gonna be a nice, healthy, clean prune cut if it's perpendicular. I've got another visual here coming up, yeah, of these uh, proper cuts that aren't so proper. So letter A, B, and C are examples of bad cuts, improper pruning cuts. They're either way too high on the plant, so like A, it's leaving way too much of that stem still on the plant, and then B and C, they're made at the wrong angle, so it's leaving that plant open to more bacteria, fungus exposure, that kind of thing. Uh, letter D is the best example here. All right, we are up to looking at some examples of plants we can prune based on the month that we're in. We're gonna go ahead and start with May, even though we know this presentation is being delivered and um, available in June, but that's because even though we mention, in this case, we start with rhododendron to prune it in May, that is just a ballpark. What we're saying is in the month of May, that's when you should start to think about, okay, I have those rhododendron in my landscape. I do have some boxwoods and May is ideal to prune them. But we say it's a ballpark because you're still gonna watch that plant and you're still gonna pay attention to the way our weather's been this season. So maybe your rhododendron actually bloomed later than normal. Maybe it bloomed earlier. So you may actually be pruning your rhododendron at the end of May not at the beginning or not in the middle. So when we say May, you know, it may actually end up being a few days into June. Hopefully not, but that's why we're putting May in here. We're gonna get back to rhododendron and these hedges a little bit later. But here um, you can just see they're kind of, these are examples of some plants that you can look into pruning in the month of May. Next up is June, and June does take us to our conifers and our narrow leaf evergreens. We can't forget about the beautiful trees in our landscape. You do wanna start pruning those or looking at them and really seeing if they're ready to be pruned starting late June, and that may actually continue through July. 
Here we're pruning for that overall desired shape, just like we would with our hedge plants. And while we're pruning for that shape, we do want to make sure we're looking out for and removing any limbs that don't have new limbs or needles. They're not going to start producing them if they're not right now. So go ahead and prune them off. And we've got our pine candles pointed out there. You know, if your conifers or your evergreens in your landscape are young enough, they're small enough that you can easily get to those pine candles and remove them, you can. That picture's in the bottom left of a pine candle. When you take off the pine candles, it really helps the overall foliage growth. So it makes it a more fuller, denser tree. But we are in no way recommending that if you have mature trees in your landscape, that you try to get up on a ladder high enough to get away all your pine candles. It's perfect, perfectly fine to not, uh, pr well, I can't talk, sorry. It is perfectly fine to not prune those off. I tried to say it was fine, but I guess I don't think it is. <laughs> but I promise it is okay. Next up, we're going into July and August still. This is when you can start looking at pruning your trees that we sometimes refer to as bleeders. By that, we mean that these trees release a lot more sap when they're cut than other trees. That's going to include your maples, birch, elm, you got your snowbell, and even your dogwoods. So in that case, we always say that light pruning is best, which means less pruning cuts is better. So take your time on these. Um, that might mean that you do less pruning on this tree this year and you come back to it next season to finish up, just you know, to be careful. Here you'll see we've also brought back that visual for the three cut method, because since we're dealing with trees, you're most likely dealing with those branches that are bigger than that two inch diameter size. And of course, anytime you're dealing with pruning trees or the larger limbs, you can always call in an arborist so they can help, they can give advice and all that good stuff on that. Still with July and August, wanted to touch base on our roses. Now here you want to make sure you're just pruning the leggy plants and that's the plants that have those really long stems. That's why we call them leggy. Um, think about those stems on the plant you've seen before where it really looks like they were just reaching for the sun. So they threw out this really long stem before they threw out some leaves. That's a leggy plant. Prune away the leggy parts. And then after you prune, you want to make sure you fertilize because that's really going to improve your fall flowering for your roses. Those hedges, this is where you can touch them up as needed. Keep the bottom wider than the top again. This is the second time you're allowed to prune them. Remember how we said <clears throat> that's kind of a special case. Uh, brambles, which of course your roses, but your bramble berries. So think about blackberries and raspberries. Here is a good time to start looking at pruning them. So you want to remove the wood that bore any early fruit. And you can go ahead and cut those canes pretty close to ground level. All right, we are up to September and guess what? You're done. You should be done with summer pruning. Now based again on the season and how your plants are responding, you may be pruning a few days into September, but really the goal is to not be. Of course, if you're still seeing dead or diseased or damaged tissue in your landscape, go ahead and remove that. But for the most part, you are done with that summer pruning. You can go ahead and clean your tools and store them for winter. Now we want to go ahead and get a little bit more specific about some of those plants that we know are very common in our East Tennessee landscapes and kind of talk about how to specifically prune those plants. So before we get to our first one, to stress it again, is you really, really, really need to know what plant you're dealing with. So identification, correctly identifying that plant is really the key to getting your pruning right. That's gonna set the stage for everything you do based on the season that you prune and how you go about pruning it. <clears throat> so just wanted to give you that friendly reminder again. Now let's go ahead and take a look at our azaleas. We know they bloom late spring and they tend to be a low maintenance plant. They really, really can thrive when you take off that old wood occasionally. So don't think that you have to do this every pruning season. I mean, you may if your plant's that mature and big enough. Again, keep in mind that one-third rule. 
So if they're responding and thriving to that old wood being removed occasionally, odds are you're kind of thinning that plant out. So if you want to think of it like a thinning type pruning technique, you can. And they can actually be headed to help you create that classic mound effect. Our boxwoods again, so back to our hedge plants, but boxwoods we know there's tons of types of boxwoods out there, but overall they are a low maintenance group. This is the one where you can prune them twice a year, um, early spring or in early summer. You may just need to prune them once. I feel like mine, I, I could prune probably once a week for three months and they'd be fine. I, you can't kill these boxwoods in my yard. Not that I've tried, I'm just saying. <laughs> They are out there to live, man. They are living their best life. With those boxwoods specifically, though, young plants do benefit from frequent shaping. Now, I don't mean prune them seven times a year, but, you know, keeping up with them on a normal annual schedule of pruning really helps them, and that really does help you get that overall shape in that mature hedge. Um, removing any of those dead branches as you go. They tend to have some dead and unsightly branches, you know, deep within the boxwood kind of thing. And that last one, they are very susceptible to boxwood blight. That's why it's really important to sanitize your tools if, you know, you are actually removing diseased plant tissue. Now, here's the thing with those boxwoods. They can be so dense that you've been, you know, pruning away from the bottom up and everything looks fine. You, you're 20 cuts in to pruning this plant and all of a sudden you realize, I think I might have some blight in the middle of this plant. Well, if you haven't been sanitizing your tool as you go, then you may already have cut some blight stems and now you're spreading it. So anytime I'm out there pruning my boxwoods, I do sanitize as I go. Because to me, it just sneaks right up on you in those denser plants. Butterfly, bush, and crepe myrtle. I think the post-it says it all. Don't even think about it. If you're pruning your crepe myrtle in the summer, that is the reason that in the gardening industry, we have the term crepe murder. Please wait until late winter to prune these. So like February is ideal. So we're not going to consider these at all to be a summer pruning plant. Nope, nope, nope. Late winter. Then we've got some hollies here for our examples. We've got four common types of hollies for us. You can see a picture of each of the four types, their names underneath it, and a little statement about, you know, just a, an I, um, item to keep in mind when you're pruning them. And we also, of course, have summer prune only for the 3Ds, dead, diseased, or damaged. For Scythia, that's the one we kind of used earlier when we said, hey, this is the one that likes to grow all natural and loose like a spray, so don't try to um, prune it in a way to make it rigid and upright because that's just not how it, you know, naturally grows. It does bloom in the spring, um, and we prune within eight weeks of the last flowers. You all may be thinking, eight weeks? You're giving me two months? So we're just saying within that time frame of the last flowers. So the forsythia we have in my neighborhood, I live closer to the Morristown area, um, it's massive. I mean, it is well established and it is huge. So to watch it flower, it goes on for quite a while. So, you know, when you think that plant is pretty much finished up flowering, go ahead and prune it. So just that's why we've got that eight week window out there. It is considered pretty much a low maintenance plant and that mature plant can be reduced by that one third method so don't cut back more than one third still but you can take up to one third off of it and it can really be rejuvenated by cutting it back within four to six inches off the base again we don't recommend doing that to more than one third of the plant but if you've got a part of that forsythia that looks like who it just might be on its last legs go ahead and cut it back four to six inches off the base you know from the ground and um, it, odds are it'll bounce right back. It's a tough little plant when you do that. It's kind of amazing. And we kind of started with our rhododendron. Here we've got it again. Um, these do not really tolerate heavy pruning very well at all. So make sure you're not taking away anything more than one year's growth. Make that cut just above the leaf bud, bud you can see kind of in that picture. You want to take off that hardened wood um, any time of the year except during a freeze. Remove those spent flowers, you know, take those heads off. That's going to let the plant harden off before winter. 
And then you want to look out for crossing branches or branches that are touching the ground. Kind of remove those throughout the plant when you can, just so it stays healthier and doesn't rub against each other. A rhododendron can be susceptible to getting damage like that. All right. Well, that was the last of our specific plants to look into with that pruning specific information. And that does bring us to the end of our presentation on summer pruning. We covered a lot of ground, starting with those three Ds of pruning proper tools and cuts, that special East Tennessee date of July 1st, which plants to prune during those summer months. Thank you so much for joining us for our virtual presentation. We hope you enjoyed this presentation and that you learned something that will help you in your gardening endeavors. Whether that means more blooms on your flowers and ornamental shrubs, attracting more pollinators to your garden, or improving your vegetable production. As we were not able to field your questions today, we want to close by offering you some ways to reach us. As you can see on this slide, we have a presence on Facebook. You may post questions to either of these Facebook pages. Feel free to upload a photo, especially if it helps to describe the problem you have. If you are not a Facebook user, you may call the Extension Office at 865-215-2340 and leave a detailed message with your question. Your question will be forwarded to a Master Gardener to research and respond to you. You may also send an email to Rylan Thompson, the Knox County Extension Agent who advises the local Master Gardener program. If a photo would help to describe the problem, Feel free to attach one or two. Try to keep the total attachments to less than five megabytes. You may get a response directly from Rylan, or he may route your question to a master gardener to research and respond to you. We are eager to return to public presentations. In the meantime, you can watch any of our recorded presentations by going to our website, finding a Speakers Bureau event on the calendar, and clicking on the link that is included within the event details. Now, let's go get some dirt under our fingernails. <laughs>